Hello class. Uh, so this video is going to be covering Thomas Nagel's Moral Luck, and I'm choosing this article uh, as a follow-up to Kant, uh, kind of for the obvious reason. Uh, Nagel makes it very clear right from the beginning how this article is going to connect up with what we were just reading from Kant. Uh, so he starts off by quoting Kant, saying, Kant believes that the goodwill is not good because of what it affects or accomplishes, or because of any of these other things. Um, it's only good in and of itself. Uh, so the thought that Kant has, and, and actually I think that he's, this is a, an incredibly plausible idea. Whether, whether Nagel is right or not, I think that Kant has really nailed something important about our ordinary way of thinking about morality, uh, which is that we, in some sense, we think that we should only be uh, blamed or praised for things that were actually within our control. And so what Nagel is going to be doing with this article, or what he did do, is to challenge this idea. Um, he's not necessarily saying that we should blame people for things that are outside of their control. He's not saying that our intuition here is wrong. What he's pointing out is that there seems to be this tension. On the one hand, it seems like we agree with Kant. Let me move down a little bit. We agree with Kant that people cannot be morally assessed for what is not their fault or for factors that are outside of their control. That seems right. I mean, and that's, that is a part of our ordinary way of thinking about morality. The problem is that our ordinary way of thinking about morality also includes a lot of ideas that seem to be directly in, con in, in tension with this. Uh, so, so the problem that Nagel is pointing out, and actually for those of you who are interested in philosophy in a more general way, this is sort of the thing that Nagel does. Uh, this guy, Thomas Nagel, is really, really good at identifying implicit or hidden contradictions in the ways that, in common sense, in the ways that we ordinarily think. So what he's doing in this article is pointing out this tension or contradiction in the way that we ordinarily think about morality. So on the one hand, we think that people should only be assessed for what is under their control. But when we actually look at the way that we judge people, it looks like we judge them to a large extent based on things that are outside of their control. Uh, and Nagel gives a lot of examples. I mean, that's kind of, well, this whole paper is him giving a series of examples. So he says, you know, however jewel-like the goodwill it may be, you know, and this is using Kant's language. Kant says that the goodwill will shine like a jewel, even if all of the consequences of our actions turn out to be bad. But Nagel's saying, like, even if that's right, there is a morally significant difference, and he means there's a morally significant difference in our common sense, ordinary way of thinking about morality, between rescuing somebody from a burning building and accidentally dropping him on the twelfth story while trying to rescue him. Um, that, like, we, we think that people who succeed in doing good things are actually better, have done something better than people who tried and failed. And, and the same thing goes the other way around when we're thinking about bad actions. You might ask yourself, I mean, and, and actually I think this is a good question to ask yourself. Two questions, actually. First off, how much, how, what kind of punishment do you think that somebody should get for drinking and driving? Well, okay, hard to say, really hard to say. Um, but we, one thing that you would be inclined to say is that we, we should punish them, right? Like, get, you know, drinking under the influence is non-trivial. Uh, it's not something where we should just be like, ha ha, no, kids will be kids. Yeah, go out and get drunk and drive. But, but you also probably think that the punishment should be less severe than the punishment for going out, drinking and driving, and, and killing somebody. But the difference between the drunk driver who is lucky and gets home safe and without you know running anyone over and the drunk driver who got extremely unlucky and you know kid run it ran out in the middle of the road they their reaction time was slow so they ended up hitting this child and killing them we think we ordinarily think that there's a difference that we should punish the one who actually killed the child much much more than the one who didn't but if Kant is right, I mean, if it's right that we should only be judging people for what they intend, uh, you know, their, their choices, not based on the consequences, then there's something very puzzling about that. Um, and in fact, I would even suggest that if we really think about it, using this sort of Kantian framework, it might be that we should punish the drunk driver who gets lucky more than the drunk driver who actually kills the child. Well, that's crazy. Why would you why would you give someone a harsher punishment for a DUI than for, you know, accidental manslaughter? Well, here's the thought. The person who accidentally kills a child 
you know, assuming they're a normal human being, they're going to be absolutely devastated by this. I mean, this is something that's going to rack their conscience for the rest of their life. They're going to always have this guilt hanging over their head. Whereas the person who has driven drunk and then just, you know, goes home and is safe, they're fine. They are, they're, they're not going to think twice about it, probably. Uh, so maybe the person who kills the child it has already suffered more than the person who didn't. And if we think that we should only judge people for based on their intentions, maybe we should give a slightly less harsh uh, sentence to the person who killed the child to make up for the fact that they already feel so bad and punish the drunk driver who got lucky more severe. Maybe. But see, that's the exact opposite of what we ordinarily do. And that suggests that ordinary ethics is not in conformity with Kantian, with Kantian morality as much as we might normally think, or as much as it might seem on the surface. Now, I, I want to just highlight a few of the really important pieces here to kind of set you up to see where Nagel is going with this article. Uh, and then the rest of it should flow very naturally after you've got that set up. Uh, so he says, reading the highlighted bit here, where a significant aspect of what someone does depends on factors beyond his control, yet we continue to treat him in that respect as an object of moral judgment, it can be called moral law. Now this is an important line. Um, I mean, when you're, if you choose to write your paper on this, this particular issue, I would strongly recommend citing this line. You don't need to quote it directly, but, but this is a really important line. Why? Well, because he's defining moral luck. Uh, and if you're looking at a paper that's on topic X, my advice for you is figure out where the author defines X and pay a lot of attention to that. Uh, I mean, so this is about moral luck, and that means we really, really ought to know what moral luck is. And Nagel spells it out very clearly here. Moral luck is when the moral evaluation that we give to somebody depends in some non-trivial way on factors that are outside of their control. That, like whether they did the right thing or the wrong thing, or how good or how bad their actions were, is going to depend on things that, well, it's going to depend on luck rather than something that they actually chose. And he points out the problem posed by this phenomenon, uh, which led Kant to deny its possibility, is that the broad range of external influences here identified seems on close examination to undermine moral assessment as surely as it does the narrow range of familiar excusing conditions. Well, okay, so what are these, what's the narrow range of normal conditions? Well, what he has in mind here are situations where we would all agree, like, yes, this person is not to be blamed, or their blame should be much less, because there were circumstances outside of their control. Um, so, for example, when we find out that somebody has a severe mental disability, um, say like schizophrenia, that goes some way towards explaining their behavior and for leading us to think that they should not be punished as severely. Uh, which actually is a little, uh, I don't know, it's, it's interesting, because if you really push this issue, then what we're saying is that you shouldn't be held as responsible for your actions if there's something in your brain that made you do it. Or imagine, I mean, imagine somebody giving this excuse, like, you know, it wasn't my fault, my brain made me do it. It's like, well, your brain always makes you do it. You're always doing what, I mean, your physical body is moving based on the activity in your brain. In some cases, we use the activity of the brain as an excuse, like when someone has like a legion or brain damage or some sort of neurological disorder. But in other cases, um, say if someone's like, well, yeah, I've got, a, I've got the brain of an asshole, um, and that's, that's what's causing me to be an asshole. You'd be like, well, the fact that you have a brain of an asshole is actually because you are an asshole. Uh, and that's not going to be, you know, that's not going to excuse you or make it okay. So sometimes we want, we're okay with using this idea of moral luck to excuse people. Other times we're not. And part of what Nagel's trying to point out here is that we're actually highly inconsistent in the way that we're doing this. And the only person who was entirely consistent was Immanuel Kant. But what, what Nagel's trying to point out is that Kant didn't realize just how far-reaching moral luck was. Uh, Kant was thinking about the obvious cases, uh, but was really oblivious to just how widespread this phenomenon is. Why was, he wide, why was he ignorant of it? Well, some of this might just be chalked up to his, his uh, religious background. Uh, he believes in a very strong notion of free will. And if you believe in this strong libertarian notion of free will, then you're going to you're going to think that people have more control over things than well than otherwise. 
Okay, well, I, I don't want to I don't want to assess whether we do or do not have free will. Um, that's not exactly the issue here, but but it is a, a very important issue that's kind of creeping in in the background. So so good thing to keep think in mind, or sorry, good thing to keep in mind as you're reading through this is that this crucially relates to the free will question, and we should be asking ourselves, do we have free will? What does it mean for us to have free will, and how does that actually play out in our behavior and in our moral assessment of people? Okay, so I want to move on to this next line. Uh, Nagel says, when the seemingly natural requirement of fault or responsibility is applied in light of these factors, the, the moral luck factors, it leaves few pre-reflective moral judgments intact. Um, if, if we agree with Kant that we should only be blamed for things that are under our control, then if Nagel is right, it's going to turn out that we actually shouldn't blame people for things basically ever. Um, well, then he says, why not conclude then that the condition of control is false? And what he means by this is, well, if, if it turns out that our intuition that we should only blame people for what they have control over uh, logically entails that we should never blame anybody ever, maybe we should give up on this idea of requiring control. That's a plausible idea. I mean, that's one possible route here. Um, so in general, there are three routes you can take. One route is to deny that we, there is moral luck, or, or at least to deny that moral luck is as pervasive as Nagel is suggesting. Uh, and roughly, this would be the route that would correspond to con the Kantian moral perspective. A, a second route you could go is to say, yes, there is this moral luck that does undermine free will, that undermines personal responsibility, and ultimately that undermines morality as a whole. You can do that. Um, that would that would push you closer towards something called nihilism, or uh, also called error theory, uh, or more of a skeptical view where we think eh, morality morality is mostly BS. Uh, it's a game that we made up to help to control people, but the game is not logically consistent. It's not real. Third option, um, one that Nagel actually doesn't talk about here, is to go down the consequentialist road. Um, so the, the utilitarians go down the consequentialist road. For the utilitarian, morality is not based on free will, it's not based on what we have control over or individual decisions or intentions. Instead, morality is just based on what objectively makes things better or worse, uh, what will produce more happiness or less suffering, um, those sorts of things. And, and if that's our standard, then it actually doesn't matter whether someone intended to do the right thing or not. Uh, all that matters is the consequences that come as a result of that action. So then, if we were utilitarians and we wanted to ask this question, when should we blame people? I'm not going to answer that question, but I invite you to answer it. Uh, think about this. When should a utilitarian judge somebody or blame them for their actions? And I'll give you two hints. First off is it doesn't depend on, on whether the person actually had control. And second, it actually has nothing to do with the morality of that person's actions. At least not directly. Uh, there is no direct connection between when a utilitarian should blame people and when those people actually did something wrong. But I, I'll leave it to you to think about when they actually should blame them. Um, it's an interesting thinking puzzle. Okay, so the so last thing I want to say in this introductory video is just highlighting the four conditions that Nagel brings up. And Nagel is thinking of these as the four different ways that moral luck interferes with our ordinary way of ascribing moral, moral judgment, blame, and praise. Now, I'll be honest, I actually think that there are only three conditions here. He mentions four, but one of them seems to just be repeating the others, so I'm going to just emphasize three of these. Okay, so the first one is constitutive luck, the kind of person you are. Why would that count as luck? I mean, it seems like the kind of person I am is, if anything is under my control, the kind of person I am is under my control. That's actually not obvious. Uh, when you look at research in psychology, it turns out that a lot of what goes into determining your personality and your character traits is based more on genetics than it is on anything else. Uh, it's roughly 50-55% genetics, if we had to put numbers to it. What's the rest? Well, surely some of it is going to be your upbringing, the kinds of parents you had, the kinds of friends that you were hanging out with, and in some sense those things are outside of your control. Uh, you don't really control what kind of neighborhood you live in, what kind of parents you have, your genes, all that stuff. And if that stuff determines what kind of person you are, then it looks like a substantial part of who you are is outside of your control. Second one is circumstances. Some of us are put into circumstances that allow us to do great heroic things, others not so much. Some of us get into put into lousy circumstances where we have to make hard choices, some of us don't. That seems to be a matter of luck. 
I'm going to ignore this third one because I think that's the one that just repeats the others. And then the final one is the consequences of our actions. And that's what we've been talking about generally with Kant. Uh, we shouldn't be blamed for things that are outside of our control, including the consequences of our actions.